Okay. Our next talk will be from Andreas Krenmeier from Austria. He will talk about secure server daemon programming under Unix and will show us some pitfalls which are not so obvious, but you should, of course, handle in your code. And he's working for a software development company in Austria. Have fun. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my talk. Hmm? I'm going to talk about the topic secure network server programming on Unix. Um, it's about the dangers and pitfalls of implementing a server daemon that provides some sort of service. Um, and I will talk about how to avoid the biggest security issues. Yeah, a few bits about me. I'm Andreas Krenmer. I work as a software developer. I have, well, an interest in security-related topics. It doesn't mean that I'm really the superhero or whatever um, in this area, but, well, I, I did some work, and it's quite interesting for me. Um, some of my previous work uh, works are um, the, the prototype for a, um, a new type of network intrusion detection system that I presented about uh, three and a half years ago um, at the camp at this time, and Contra Police, that's a, a heap smash prevention facility. Um, it has been mentioned last year in the talk about memory, memory allocator security, so some of you may be um, um, already know about it. And here I'm going to present something new. Um, I'm going to talk about um, Trapdoor 2. Um, uh, I will talk what it exactly is. I will talk about it later. And um, it's an example for, well, how to securely program. So the agenda is a general introduction. Then I will talk about the design and implementation of uh, Trapdoor 2. Then about the possible attack vectors, the obvious ones, the not so obvious ones. So implementation errors in Trapdoor 2 itself implementation errors in SSL, TSL implementations, and uh, what we can do about denial of service attacks um, right at the application. And some of the conclusion, conclusions then we, that we can draw from it. So um, as an introduction, um, a very simplifying uh, view on, on writing secure code Write secure code a summary. Don't use system and be careful with buffers. And then an answer on slash dot. Brain surgery a summary. Open skull and poke around with stick. So um, a more sophisticated view on security issues than this is definitely required. And this summary doesn't even scratch the surface. Yeah, general, um, general coding style. There are really a lot of papers and articles about secure programming with language like C or C++ or whatever. But this is beyond the presentation. Um, it, th this presentation really doesn't cover any language-specific security issues. Um, um, everything I'm talking about is more on the operating system level. So um, even you, even you use um, a more secure language than C, um, this can be still interesting. So. Um, I will talk about if issues that well cannot pre, uh, pre, cannot be prevented by by the language um, itself. So uh, my advice is anyway use more secure languages like Dylan or C plus um, plus if you have the freedom to do so, um, and that's a, a practical pro uh, problem. There are so many great languages out there. Um, where you can really securely program at least on the uh, level of buffer overflows so that that kind of stuff is, is prevented. Um, but when you're working in the industry, you hardly have any chance to, to use these languages because there is so much uh, legacy code um, that you uh, cannot simply rewrite uh, because there's so many man hours, man months, man years in it, you cannot simply throw it away. After all, it's, it's um, most of the legacy code is, is more or less well tested or uh, 
um, widely used, so um, there is no chance practically um, to use Dillon or Eiffel or uh, other kind of uh, other languages of that kind, simply because you have to build upon something and cannot start from scratch. And I mentioned uh, C++ as a more secure language. Um, be sure to use modern C++, and by modern C++, I mean all the features and stuff that uh, comes with the C++ standard library. Um, uh, I, in my experience, um, most people who learn C++ do not learn about this really interesting um, standard library. You can do really a lot of stuff with it, and you don't need to do any basic uh, zero terminated string handling or anything like that, and um, you, you you produce cleaner code, better code, and um, uh, definitely code with less buffer buffer overloads. Um, nevertheless, um, chapter two is written with C, um, and we had a hard time getting it really secure. Well. It's not 100% secure, so um, if you download the, the source code from the website, uh, I'm pretty sure one, the one person or the other will find um, some bug. So nobody's perfect, just as a disclaimer. Yeah, about chapter two itself. Um, where does this come from? Um, my co-developer Clifford Wolf, some of you probably know him, uh, he regularly does lectures um, uh, at the Chaos Communication Congress and he worked on Rock Linux and he had the necessi necessity to, to poke holes into firewalls, that means um, uh, to, to, to allow a, a certain computer to connect to, for example, SSH, but only for a time window of 30 seconds or something like that. And the first solution was called Trapdoor. It was Telnet-based. You simply connected uh, using Telnet, entered a secret code, and then um, the SSH port for your uh, source address opened and you were uh, able to connect. Of course, Telnet, insecure. Um, it was clear that it had to be reworked and the improvement is Trapdoor 2. Um, it uses HTTP instead of an ad hoc Telnet based protocol and more security through the use of SSL so we uh, only allow uh, HTTPS use so um, it's not possible to, to, to sniff those magic co codes or magic cookies as we call them. So. Um, the basic principle is um, you're entering a magic cookie um, and that magic cookie is associated with a certain command. For example, opening the port for the source address for a certain amount of time or doing whatever. In, in my old company, um, uh, we used it to, to, to restart um, certain services that were quite flaky. Um, we could even use, this, uh, use it um, from, from the mobile phone via WAP, and so it was, it's quite flexible, but uh, the main idea was this trapdoor thing. Anyway, you're, you're entering, the magic, entering the magic cookie, the HTTP request is um, received, the, the magic cookie is checked, and if it's okay, the associated command is executed. And then the success status um, is sent back to the client. So um, the naive um, and really simple approach we took was a master process that's, that accepts the connection, it forks. Um, um, then you have a, a child process which again forks and is connected via uh, a socket pair or, no actually I used two pipes but it would be, would be the same if you use a socket pair. And uh, this child processes, process uh, drops the privileges, hand, uh, receives the HTTP request, hands the cookie to the parent via the pipe, um, 
the parent, this child process, then checks the cookie, runs the command if the cookie was okay, and sends the status back through the through back to the process. And the unprivileged child then sends it sends it sends it back to the client. That's quite simple. Um, we use this um, two uh, two stage um, thing uh, because you obviously cannot. Uh, 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 interact with with the, the client, which is the potential attacker, uh, with a, a root process, and you need uh, root permissions to run this uh, command here. So it's it's really the naive approach, and of course, this famous quote: "For every complex problem, there is a solution that is simple, neat, and wrong." Chapter 2 is not really wrong, but um, when we looked at it closer, after we wrote the first version, we found some, well, some obvious and not so obvious flaws. And so we, we looked a bit further and then implemented um, well, code to prevent certain attacks. And the main attack vectors um, we identified was First of all, implementation errors in Chapter 2 itself. For example, buffer overflows, integer overflows, all that um, kind of usual stuff uh, you have to um, ca care about when you use a low-level language like C. Then another main attack vector is the SSL implementation, like for example, OpenSSL um, or GNU TLS or whatever you use. And there are also denial of service attacks, which can become a huge problem since we forked two times and new processes usually take quite a few of resources, memory, CPU time. So you need to prevent um, your own resource deviation. But what um, we, we cannot really care about is that uh, is uh, are, are logical errors, but ideally, um, such logical errors errors, errors uh, should be found through unit tests. We haven't implemented any unit tests, so as I, as I said before, we're not perfect. But um, C code, um, unless um, you really design it from the very beginning uh, to be uh, capable. Uh, uh, to, to, to be unit tested, it's, it's almost um, uh, impossible to write really good unit tests. Usually C code is, is um, uh, very coupled. At least I haven't seen any really good C code that was uh, unit testable. At least not in the industry. Yeah, let's talk about the implementation errors themselves. Um, as I mentioned before, yeah, chapter 2 runs with root privileges, which is a, a big threat. And so you have this uh, one child process that interacts with the client and you really have to apply the principle of least privileges to this child process. That means you need to drop the user, the group, the, the user and group privileges you need to uh, put the process in, the, in a change root environment so that there is no possibility to interact um, with the environment of other processes with possibly higher uh, uh, higher privileges, and that uh, that this unprivileged process has no access to a usable file system. And of course, the communication between the two child processes, the unprivileged child process and the privileged child process, um, is um, going over um, two pipes. Or you can also use a socket pair. Um, and we use a strictly enforced communication protocol. And of course, what's also very important, you have to enable really strict resource limits. A few code snippets. Yeah, that's not really interesting. 
drop your um, group and user IDs. Be sure to drop the, the group before the user ID um, because otherwise you may not have the, the permissions anymore. Then what's also very important about change root, um, change root doesn't really work unless you, you change your uh, current working directory to the change root uh, directory. You always need to care about this. So either you do it this way or you, or you do the, the change root first and then a, a change directory slash. And as you can see here, always check about uh, return values. Actually, this code is quite boring, but that's the simplest way to, to, to show this all. The communication between the two child processes, um, well, as I said before, it's, it's, it's quite boring code, but um, what we uh, always checked was, was that, that certain sizes uh, were, were not overrun so that, uh, that, that no buffer flow of any, um, any kind can happen. And that's, that's really crucial because that, that's really one of the, the attackable uh, parts. So you need to get that right. So design your, your communication protocol as simple as possible. A few more words on resource limits. Um, what we did was um, we limited the maximum CPU time that the child process uh, may use to two seconds. Um, we found it to be enough. Uh, we limited to the maximum size of the data segment, the maximum size of the stack, um, the maximum size of the RSS, and the maximum real time. And that is really important because that makes it really hard uh, to take over the unprivileged process, which is in its, in its change root environment, and use it for any long-running tasks, even if it's uh, unprivileged uh, and, and you can take it over and use it for a long time, you can use it for zombies, for botnets, because even then it's uh, in the regular conditions uh, allowed to, to um, uh, bind to a high port and accept network connections. Um, and that's why you, you need to enforce that so that after 10 seconds the line is cut and the process dies. So um, uh, that's how you can um, well prevent that your unprivileged child process is used for any, um, yeah, for example, city at home or as a, a zombie for a botnet or any other distributed computing effort. Again here, the set R limit. It, it provides quite a few options what you can do. Um, and um, the, the, the best advice for, for the, the, the values that, you, you, um, that we use is that you should use is just experiment. <laughs> it's, it's really difficult to, to find it out and uh, experimentally we found out that the values we, values we used uh, worked um, good enough. Um, we had some, some issues with, with GNU TLS because we support both, both OpenSSL and GNU TLS, GNU TLS as um, um, SSL library and GNU TLS um, requires a lot more resources. So it, it, it has um, a minimum requirement of something like 32 file descriptors and um, uh, we needed, I think, uh, eight seconds of, of CPU time because it does some, some really weird stuff like busy waiting. So it really takes up a lot of CPU time. And this whole principle uh, with putting an unprivileged process um, into a change root environment and having it communicate with a privileged process is called privilege separation. Um, well, 
you're using the unprivileged process is, of course, unprivileged. It means it has a user ID and group ID of greater than zero. It's in a change root environment. Resource limits are enforced. It directly communicates with the client, and the client is the attacker or potential attacker. And it also communicates with the privileged process. But um, the privileged process only does, uh, does the few things um, that, that really need um, uh, the well higher privileges than the, the completely unprivileged process. So usually these aren't a lot of um, operations. Uh, in, in our case, it was only the checking of the magic cookie and running the command. The, yeah, calling the IP tables binary. Yeah, as mentioned before, this concept is called privilege separation. It was first described in a really good paper um, with the title Preventing Privilege Escalation by Nils Provos, Markus Friedel, and Peter Honeyman. And the first implementation was OpenSSH. And um, OpenBSD, in its effort to improve overall security, um, implemented this concept of privilege separation in virtually all um, servers they provide, like NTPD and, and, and syslog daemon. And it seems to work. And uh, it's quite cheap to get a lot better security. So it, it doesn't take a lot more resources um, compared to, to other means of, of uh, defeating uh, attempts of attack. Yeah. Another important thing um, are implementation errors in SSL and TLS. This is something that people usually do not really care about because it's a piece of software, black box, black box just a library that you use and that's supposed to work. But SSL, TLS implementations have been shown to be vulnerable in the past. And that's when attack against the SSL implementation is really likely. Um, I, I found a few numbers and the Secunia, um, this I think Swedish um, uh, security company, they have 11 open SSL advisories from a time span from 2003 to 2006. So that's quite a lot. And the US search Department of Homeland Security has 21 open SSL related and four GNU TLS related vulnerabilities in the last three years. So SSL is really something that uh, is quite likely to be, to be attacked. So you need to uh, care about it. And so we, we looked at how you usually implement SSL and found a quite a simple solution. Because usually you first read keys and certificates from the file system. You initialize, initialize the SSL subsystem. It does, um, let me see, it loads error strings. You add algorithms and other fancy stuff. Then we enter the change root environment and drop all privileges and then we initialize the actual SSL connection. And that's the point where uh, the attacker is first able to um, uh, interact with us at all. So th the first contact, the first interaction is already in a secure environment. And as mentioned before, Chapter 2 supports both OpenSSL and GNU TLS in order to provide um, an alternative in case one of the two has been compromised. So I told you the numbers before, it's quite likely. And when you see shit and unpatched uh, OpenSSL vulnerability, let's switch to GNU TLS. Although um, the code quality of GNU TLS in some parts is quite dubious. So um, I wouldn't really recommend it. After all, there aren't that many SSL implementations uh, out there, especially not for, for Unix-like systems. So OpenSSL is really standard. Yeah, 
just a if short code snippet. Um, we have this init SSL, which does all the fancy stuff, as I mentioned before, load error strings, add SSL algorithms, create the SSL context, it loads the certificate, private key, and all that stuff. And the init SSL2, which happens after dropping the privileges, associates the file descriptor with the uh, SSS handler that you need to um, communicate via SSL. And then it accepts the SSL connection. The third problem we came, came upon was um, denial of service. Um, we identified uh, two main points, namely denial of service attacks against system blogging when in the, in the very unlikely case that you do uh, take over process that you, you run an attack against system logging or run an attack against forking, basically connecting a really lot of times during a very short period of time. Because too many connections but time frame lead to ma too many processes and too much system load and your system may become unusable for um, for, for users that actually should use it. So in the case an attacker really is able to take, take over an unprivileged child process, um, the hard disk could be filled up by when, when you're running thousands of syslog calls per second. And to slow down such an attack, the number of syslog messages per time frame is simply limited. It's, it's quite simple. And it has the disadvantage that we implemented only a, a wrapper around the syslog uh, system call called limit syslog. And when some exploit code runs the syslog system call directly, that doesn't quite work. So the, the syslog daemon actually has to care about this too, uh, but it's not such a great threat anyway. It's only for uh, the situation when, for example, exploit code calls parts of our own code, which very often which does uh, syslog calls, and so that's where um, the limit syslog comes into effect. And here, the, the more interesting stuff, um, Credits for this uh, go to, to Clifford uh, only because um, he's the one who developed it and, and um, it's quite simple and quite effective. Yeah, th the basic problem is that when you have too many connections per time frame, it leads to too many child processes. Um, uh, in, in the drawing before, one connection leads to two child processes, so that's quite a lot of resources. And of course, too much system load, your system may become unusable. So you need to limit the incoming connections per source IP, plus um, the number of incoming connections at all. But chapter two should still be functional and responsive for users from other IP addresses. And that's how we implemented our countermeasure. Um, we used the source IP from the client plus a random value, which change, changes every eight seconds. Um, we hash this and um, divide this um, by the number of slots uh, and, and uh, take the remaining part, and this is the slot number. And for every slot, um, the number of connections uh, is counted per time frame. Um, if the count is higher than a certain threshold, then the request is simply rejected before even the, the, the fork is um, going to happen. And after every time frame, the, these eight seconds, uh, the counter is reset and the random value changes. Um, the number of slots is currently 397. So that means that only a maximum of 4,000 
764 requests per eight second time frame is allowed. But only if the attacker is um, able to find source addresses, addresses so that um, the distribution for the uh, um, slot numbers is, is quite uniform. Um, we, or Clifford, developed an own hash algorithm which is quite compact, provides pretty good distribution even for the changing random values. You can also use MD5 or SHA1. Um, all you need is, well, something to get a value from 0 to 396 to get one of your slots. The hashing algorithm is quite simple. Um, that's the code. It's, it's running really fast and it's good enough for what we need. And why is it, why do we know that it's good enough? Because um, we did a few simulations and on this scale you can see the slots and on this scale you can see um, the number of occurrences for a certain slot. And I, I simply um, generated 2,000 random IPs and hashed them with the same random value and uh, computed the slot number and that's um, how it distributes. Looks pretty good. We didn't do any more formal research. We, we simply generated the graphics and looked at it, looked at them and at least for, for the random IPs, that's what you usually have when um, you're having a distributed denial of service attack. Um, uh, you have more or less random IPs. That's one way of distributed denial of service attacks. The other one is when an attacker um, has a, a whole subnet and uses it to, to attack your server. And we also did um, that for a, a slash 20 subnet and um, the distribution looks different. And that's just one example. And um, it's really weird graphics, but we, we couldn't find any, any, any um, modifications to the hashing algorithm to, to significantly improve that. But it, it's, it's good enough anyway. I generated a few more. Um, because, uh, as I mentioned before, every eight seconds um, this random value changes. So every uh, every eight seconds you have different kind of, of curve here. So uh, at another time frame it may look like this. 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 All this, so it's it's not really easy to predict um, how um, um, the distribution really uh, really is going on. Um, as you can see, the the second graph or, or the the number of, of of graphs that I showed you from from the slash twenty um, attack. It isn't uniformly distributed, but it, it uh, exposes an interesting paradox. Um, uh, since it doesn't provide an, a, a uniform distribution, uh, it, does, it actually allows fewer parallel connections because the th threshold is, for example, at, why do we have a good graphic? Yeah, this was, the threshold is at, at 12. And so that's quite a lot of, um, quite uh, a lot of connect connections that are, are really um, rejected. And it's really hard to find out for the attacker um, where this well kind of hole is where you can concentrate on with more connections. And so the conclusion is that um, when you assume that there are no leg legitimate legitimate users in a compromised subnet, this observed property actually reduces the effectiveness of the denial of service attack. 
So when we look at, looks pretty weird. Um, when we look at the, the naive approach that we took and apply the, 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 the changes or improvements that I'm, I mentioned here, uh, we did a few things. For example, we have the connection limiting here for the forking. Um, we have here a, a strict communication protocol for the two uh, child processes that communicate. This unprivileged child process really has as little privileges as possible and this whole concept with the communication protocol and as little privileges as possible, this all together is the privilege separation. So that the conclusions uh, that uh, we can draw um, from from our work is uh, there are some some uh, flaws that are not quite obvious, and you you need to uh, need to care about them. And uh, here we described some countermeasures for certain attacks. Um, so um, just looking for buffer overflows is not enough. And you, you need, really need to care about privileges. And it's, it's also always about employing safety nets. So um, you always need to care about defense in depth. Um, you you uh, should not only care about privileges, but you can also um, uh, tackle, for example, the buffer overflow problem by either using a more secure language or um, uh, these um, uh, stack or heap overflow um, stuff that is implemented in uh, current C libraries or the compilers themselves. Or you can be even more strict uh, on, on the operating system permission level. Um, at least that, um, that things that uh, Unix really allows. Okay, um, one important thing that I want to mention, nobody's perfect, so shit can happen and shit really happens at Murphy's Omnipresent. So, are there any... Now, for, first I want to thank a few people. For example, uh, Clifford Wolf, who had the initial idea, the co-author, he's the co-author of Chapter 2. Um, he provided some, some very valuable things and a few of my friends um, who um, gave me lots, lots of valuable feedback um, about this, this whole thing. Here are a few um, addresses. Here you can find chapter two. Um, it's, actually, we have, we have an old um, version online where there, where there are quite a few um, smaller issues still inside, so better check out the current version from the subversion repository. And also, if you want to know more about it and more in, in detail, read the paper that's linked uh, in the far plan in the Congress schedule. Um, also read the source, so um, we believe it's, it's um, pretty good. So, yeah, thanks uh, for attending my presentations and uh, Please ask questions if there are any. Um. Hi. Um, you um, have a bunch of code um, which is in front of your network um, and does essentially um, some authentication via a magic cookie and executes some arbitrary commands. Mm -hmm. uh, why did you reinvent OpenSSH? <laughs> um, because sometimes um, you do not have, for example, when you're at the customer, um, you, you never have these perfect conditions where you're allowed to do everything, but you, have, for example, have um, uh, only the permissions to use HTTP or HTTPS because that's all, the only thing that the, the, the client allows or um, some other uh, um, 
uh, stuff you need to care about. So that's why we implemented it based on HTTP, HTTPS, because it's such a standard protocol and virtu virtually every firewall um, lets it go through. It's as simple as that. Um, I'm just curious, with the slot distribution, you mm -hmm. said you used your own hashing algorithm. Mm -hmm. Was there a special reason you didn't use MD5 or SHA-1, or um, why did you use your own algorithm? Uh, uh, the, the, I know using your own cryptographic uh, hashing stuff is bad, because that's only the stupid people um, do. We know that, and uh, Clifford, um, who designed that, put quite a lot of effort into it that it's Good, to, good enough. So um, we, we simply used it because it was simple um, and it, it worked well enough and that's all. Um, it wouldn't be much of work to, to, to actually use MD5 or um, any similar algorithm and, and, and widely tested algorithm. So it's, it's no problem and practically from our experiences it wouldn't make that much difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there was no special reason you, why you used your own? Um, no. Okay. It's, it isn't any cryptographic hashing magic or something like that. It's really simple code and it works. That's it. Uh, hello. Uh, you change uh, hashing random seed uh, every eight seconds, yes? Uh, to, to, yeah. to, to distribute uh, processes uh. in the, the slots. And uh. Uh, the process, uh, the child process limit is uh, if I remember correctly, 10 seconds. Are these times uh, connected or you, oh, let's, let's use 10 seconds because it um, works, or? You need this eight second or 10, no, it's, it's not connected. Um, to be honest, I haven't really thought about um, uh, uh, kind of synchronizing it, but well, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be that important because within this eight uh, second window, um, Connections can happen at any time, so um, uh, when 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 the process ends, um, it can be in in in, in the the in next in different slots. In the next window, time window. Um, can you show your slide again with your source code where you read um, from from the uh, pipe? Because mm. I think there's a little bug in there. <laughs> okay. Um, you have a signed integer for the size mm. and. Yeah, go, go to the slide, please. Um. Um, yeah, that's here. Genau. You, you read um, a signed integer, four bytes, and then you check if the size is greater than 100. But if the size is now minus one, um, this, this check will pass, and yeah, then you do a cast to size t, which is actually unsigned integer. So minus one will be something like uh, four million. Mm -hmm. Or whatever, and um, the read call will, yeah, classical buffer overflow, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, from your really bad design. Fr fr from the quick look, you're right. Um, shit happens. Damn. <laughs> um, yeah. So we, we will fix it. <laughs> okay. So uh, I want to come back to the connection limiting. This is mm -hmm. unnecessary to implement it in the application. Because at least in Linux you have an IP tables model for that, mm. and it's a much better layer for that. Mm. Because you can limit it per network, per interface, and don't have to put all that stuff in your um, application. Uh, when was this implemented? I don't remember, I just read it recently. <laughs> okay, um, because we, we started with this in 2003, so I'm. Um, uh -huh. uh, so now you can rip it out. Uh, <laughs> we could. Um, but there are other Unix systems. And reduce uh, your complexity. <laughs> um, no, uh, I, I, I'd say as a wild guess, there are other Unix systems that don't provide that um, um, advanced possibilities as, as IP tables does. So, um, because uh, I had the problem with uh, IMAP demons and they had global connection limiting. Mm -hmm. It was nice and good but I need to limit uh, outside connections differently to inner connections mm -hmm. because the inner connections are a lot of people working in the company mm -hmm. and the outer connections are some uh, outsiders connecting sometimes around five or ten people. Mm -hmm. They don't need so many connections. Mm -hmm. So I would limit it differently, but the application doesn't allow that. Mm -hmm. So I had to resort to the IP tables level anyway mm -hmm. and could not basically use that feature which is just 
useless for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any further questions? Okay, since, since there are no more people in the queue, um, I again say thank you uh, for coming and have a nice time at the Congress. Bye-bye.